Hallelujah. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord on the day when Christians all over the world pause to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a people defined by His resurrection and then one day our coming resurrection. Thank you for spending your Easter Sunday with us at Longview First Church and uh, welcome to all of our guests. You have uh, blessed us by being here and uh, I know today's worship set was different. The kids did a tremendous job. The, uh, the choir just tremendous blessing. I appreciate everyone who put so much effort into this service and everybody put so much effort into every service here at Longview First Church and uh, I, I was going to start calling names of people who've you know gotten all kinds of stuff ready and I'm afraid I'm going to miss a couple and get myself in trouble but on that on that note one of those one of those people we appreciate the Thompsons they've been uh, taking care to refurbish the playground in the back so if you have kids today immediately after service Immediately after service, uh, I believe it's split up by age on the different playgrounds, but on this side of the building in the back at the playgrounds, there's an Easter egg hunt for all the kids. Next year, we need an Easter egg hunt for adults too. My mom's here. She can bring me a basket next time. It will be tremendous. Looking forward to that. And thank you to everyone who put so much energy into loving our youth and children. Speaking of youth, uh, Holiday Youth Convention is always just tremendous. Thank you to everyone who helped our youth group be there uh, Thursday and Friday. And I know you haven't got much sleep. Matter of fact, well, we're, I'm not going to pick on everybody. Where are John and Emily Warren? Are they back in yet from stepping out? Uh, how much sleep did you guys get this weekend? Yeah, yeah, amen. I, being a youth pastor may have been the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. And so we love and appreciate them. We'll be going uh, now to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 13. We're going to read a couple of scriptures and then we can all be seated. I know it's a tremendous family day and I, I love it. People uh, uh, hear some smiling, some of you, maybe the first time you've smiled all year long. And we're glad to see you smile today. Everything screams out that it's resurrection time. 1 Corinthians 15, 13. The word of the Lord said, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain. Then is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we've testified of God that He has raised up Christ. Whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He was drawing a parallel. If there, was no, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then... Christ is not raised from the dead. If Christ isn't raised from the dead, then our preaching of this scripture can't change or help anybody. And if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then we're not going to be raised from the dead. And those who've already died in Christ aren't coming back. He said, but he is. And if he is, then we know these things to be true. I want to talk to us just for a few minutes on if, then. If, then. Then, you ever tell your kids, if you clean your room on time, then you can go to the sleepover. If you don't do your chores, boy, this has been a minute for me, then, then nobody's going to Chuck E. Cheese tonight. 
if you eat all your vegetables, then you can have ice cream. I remember the if-then days. They're behind me for now. Let's ask him to help us. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, God, for the privilege to celebrate you today. We ask right now, Lord, as we get past all of our preferences and personal views and the idiosyncrasies of our personality, that we can spend the next few moments just celebrating your goodness, Lord, your word, and the miracle that you work for us. Have your way in this place, we pray, and let us leave here always more like you than we are right now. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thirteen years ago on Easter week, uh, comedian and professing atheist Ricky Gervais wrote a holiday message for Easter that was published in the Wall Street Journal titled, Why I'm a Good Christian. He began by stating frankly that he did not believe in God. But then, to prove his point, he said, I really am, though, at the same time, a good Christian compared to a lot of Christians who I know. He began by outlawing the Ten Commandments and analyzed how he fared against each one. He judged himself, as some people try that, a ten out of ten because he did not murder or commit idolatry, in his opinion, blasphemy. He said, I'm not doing bad for an atheist. But the thrust of his writing, however, was not focused on his own tally of of self-proclaimed goodness, but rather the lack of goodness in so many professing Christians in his life and in his circle. He said, it's not that I don't believe in the teachings of Jesus. I don't believe that if we followed him, it would make the world a better place. I really do think it would. But the actor who was just under 50 at the time, it says, the problem is those teachings are rarely followed. He agreed with Gandhi's words so many years before. I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. He admitted that he held the opinion, uh, the same opinion of Christianity when he believed in the Lord as a child as he did then as an adult. He said, I believe that Jesus was a man, that his message was typically one of forgiveness and kindness, and that these are wonderful virtues that are discarded by so many supposedly God-fearing people today. He said, they cherry-pick from their rule book, basically. He said, I have seen such cruelty and prejudices performed in the name of Christianity and every other religion he said for that matter so many that it makes me wonder if we're not being a little too selective with our reading and the resounding message that he would give us he finally said again quoting Gandhi your Christians are so unlike your Christ Dr. Robert Johnson a professor of theology at Fuller Seminary responded he stated sadly I believe that Gervais is correct. And whether or not his observations are completely valid, ironically, like so many other secular atheists, atheists, he really did key into something that he believed Christianity was supposed to look like. He said, maybe we should all go back to the basics and find out where we got it so confused. It feels odd to start an Easter Sunday message by agreeing with the words of an atheist. But I want to tell you, if we're not careful, we'll become so culturally religious that we miss the real point of the exercise. And we'll get so caught up uh, for good or bad in our ideas and our ideals. So good or bad in Jewish traditions or Christian traditions or Western traditions or or cultural traditions that we'll miss the entire point and and, and not really resemble our counterpart, that first century, that first generation church. The very life of Jesus Christ is bracketed by two impossibilities so astounding that they're commemorated worldwide 
in an essentially secular society to millennium after he left the scene. Our Savior arrived in the world and we celebrate this every year via a virgin death and at birth and he left through an empty tomb. He entered literally humanity through a door marked no entrance and he left through a door marked no exit. His life it began with a miracle and it ended with a miracle. People all of his life if you study his ministry discounted his virgin birth. They made the argument that it was impossible for his mother Mary to have been a virgin when he was born. After all, those angels appeared to Mary and Joseph and a ragtag group of shepherds happened to quite privately to witness this entire miracle. They were written off as the incoherent ramblings of the uneducated or gullible minds or those just from the backwaters of society. But nobody could discount the very public means of, of his resurrection. He was in a sealed, guarded tomb. Soldiers, professional soldiers who served a 20-year term for Rome were stationed outside of his tomb after he had been crucified with many witnesses, after he had hung in humiliation for many witnesses, witnesses after he was left there until he was dead and there were many witnesses he was sealed in that tomb and it was guarded listen to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1 Luke picked up his pen and said the former treaties have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the Apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion. That word literally means suffering, the Greek word pathain, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait on the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence they had witnesses not a few witnesses not a dozen witnesses they had above 500 witnesses listen to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1 the Bible says moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you've received and wherein you stand by which also ye are saved if you keep in memory that I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep after that he was seen of James then of all the apostles and last of all was seen also as one born out in due time for I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God Paul understood the importance of the resurrection he said if Jesus was resurrected then not only has the covenant changed not only has the church age began but if Jesus has been resurrected I can be forgiven and if Jesus has been resurrected I can be filled with his spirit and if Jesus has been resurrected then one day I too can be resurrected but what do we celebrate on Easter it is so important that we grasp that Jesus is not just a historical figure who really was who he claimed to be he is living and moving in our world today he was God manifest in the flesh when he made that miraculous claim and he follow through with it it's imperative that we understand today he's made a few other miraculous claims and he's going to follow through with them too John 2 19 says it like this Jesus answered and saith unto them destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up they thought he was talking about a building but he was talking about himself Matthew 20 verse number 18 behold we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death 
and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. It wasn't the miracles. It wasn't the teaching. It was the proclamation that he was the son of God that really did offend the Jewish religious hierarchy. That's why they had him arrested. Jesus went through six trials, six in a night. He was tried before Anais, before Caiaphas, the high priest, before the Sanhedrin, which was a religious supreme court in Israel of sorts, before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Jerusalem, before Herod, the governor of Galilee, and then back to Pilate for his last trial. Pilate continued time after time to examine him and say, I find no fault in him at all. They brought people in with phony charges, and those phony charges didn't stick. But what actually sent him to the cross is he refused to deny and disavow the statement that he was the Son of God. Now what's amazing that night, it's a lot like today. So many of those people, when Jesus came to encounter them, they had already made their mind up about him. They already had preconceived notions about him. They had already made a decision about who he is and who he isn't. They either believed he was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He, some said, I want to believe he's a good teacher. But he can't be a good teacher and say, I'm God manifest in the flesh. He can't be a good teacher and say, I am the way to heaven. A good person wouldn't say that unless it was true. And it put them in eternal conflict. He allowed himself to be put on trial knowing what the outcome would be. He allowed himself to be crucified even though he had the means to stop it at any moment or even reverse it. When he was hanging on the cross, the skeptics and critics mocked him. If you're the son of God, why don't you come down from the cross and show us that you really are God? But he had something more spectacular planned. I'm not trying to escape your punishment. I am going to go into the grave for three days and then I'm going to come back again. That's why when he said, uh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God come down from the cross. See, Easter really is about the good news of the resurrection and not just what it meant then and there, but what it means here and now. It's amazing to me the transformation that took place. To me, besides what's happened in my life and what we've seen and experienced in services and in prayer meetings, one of the greatest historical proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the transformation in the eyes of the disciples. Those men who hid when he was taken. Those men like Peter who denied him three times to save his own life out of fear of the mob and out of fear of justice. Those men, it clenched it. It changed everything when they saw him resurrected. They didn't just look into his empty tomb. The Bible said he showed himself to them for 40 days after the resurrection by many infallible proofs. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scripture. Don't you dare fall into that trap where people try to make this just another book and say these guys writing it, these disciples of Jesus they were just men and they didn't get it all right and they were wrong about some stuff and maybe some opinions bled through the Bible said then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures a Harvard Law professor Simon Greenleaf who lectured for years on how to break down testimony and determine whether or not a witness is lying, who worked for the FBI and helped them determine numerous times if a witness was lying. He said in the annals of military warfare, scarcely afforded it is such an example of heroic constancy and unflinching courage. It is therefore impossible that these disciples could have perished laying down their lives and affirming these truths had Jesus not actually been risen from the dead. He said that whether the teachings are true or not he said the resurrection is a fact. See anybody 
nobody can claim to be God but these people who hid out of fear and these people who forsook him when they failed and who struggled and were so inconsistent after they saw him after they saw him resurrected those same men ran to hurl themselves into martyrdom with no fear they would stand before another crowd and say choose you whether we ought to obey God or man people like Peter who denied him three times the night he was taken would later say according to history you can crucify me upside down I'm not worthy to die like he did but I'm not going to pretend like he didn't rise from the dead it changed everything now I'm headed somewhere quick listen to Romans chapter 1 verse 4 and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead Paul said if he didn't if there's no resurrection then he's not raised and if he's not raised then then this gospel can't help you and if this gospel can't help you then we're still in our sins and if we're still in our sins then then, then we're not going to rise again either and those that we've already given up are stuck in the grave forever but now he flipped that completely if Jesus rose from the dead then the gospel is true and if Jesus rose from the dead then life does not end in the grave and if Jesus rose from the dead then you and I need to do something about that now stick with me I'm just going to be a minute matter of fact you can get ready this might be the shortest message we have till summer is over in that tomb on Easter Sunday morning John chapter 20 verse 11 Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher listen to verse 12 and see if two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain past tense the only other place in Scripture where we ever find two angels facing each other is over the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. And the Jews understood, he dwelleth between the cherubims, that between those two angels abode the presence, the manifested presence of God contained in the Old Testament after the sin of man in a two foot by four foot box separated from human beings. The reason that the empty tomb is so important is that he was the one in the tomb and out of the tomb. And he wanted them to understand what used to dwell in a box, what used to dwell between cherubims. Now the whole earth is full of his glory. We don't abide by dogma and rules alone. There is a spiritual manifestation and transformation that is real in our midst. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We could tell miracle stories all day long. Out of, the, out of the, the hundreds of people here, we could start and we could never stop. Just the other day, Joel drove to uh, uh, Kil, Kilgore, Texas, to Kirbyville, Texas, because he's got that, he, he likes old school Southern gospel music. I don't know where that came from. I've tried. There's nothing I could do about it. He didn't get it from me. He loves it. And so he got his grandma to drive from Louisiana and meet him at a concert. We've covered that before. We're going to leave it right there. When they get to this singing, it's at a church, a church I've actually preached at. There's a lady there named, named Jean Bertrand. Jean attended church with us in Orangefield for five or six years. Jean, uh, how do I say this? You never know what Jean's going to say. My, uh, my wife was turning, she was old, like 35. And we planned this surprise party for her. Worked on it for a month. She had no clue. Whole church was in on it. Most of our friends were in on it. We're meeting at a, at a, at a restaurant that we frequented in Orange. And uh, uh, so before she and I take the kids to her mom and dad, and we're going to go to dinner by ourselves, she believes. And, of course, mom and dad are on their way to the restaurant. And I had pulled this off spectacularly. I don't think I've ever put that much effort uh, into a party in my life. And just before we leave to go to the restaurant, Jean calls her. And she says, Sister Moore, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make it to your surprise party tonight, but I hope you have a wonderful time. 
So last month, Jean called me. I hadn't talked to her in a couple of years. I got back in touch with her, and she was hospitalized in Houston. Major problems. Major, major tumors and issues, and it didn't look good, and it didn't sound good. And she said, everybody's prayed for me, but I want you to pray for me. And I said, well, you know, me praying isn't necessarily any more powerful than, than this one or that one or the other one. She said, yeah, but you prayed for me before, and God healed me. And I said, you listen to me. I could die today, and God can still heal you, but let's pray right now. This isn't about us. This is about Jesus. Prayed for her, hadn't heard from her again. I had a voicemail from her the other day. They walked into this Southern Gospel singing in Kirbyville, Texas, out in the middle of nowhere. And, and there's Jean Bertrand. She walked right up to my mom and told her she's not just better. She's not in remission. Everything that was there is gone. Everything that was wasn't. They weren't giving her any hope at all. And here she stood completely fine. You've heard me preach for years about what God did when our oldest son was a tubal pregnancy and how the Lord Lord moved him. You've heard us preach for years about miracles spread all through this building, but you better understand something. That resurrection spirit, it is not a religious spirit. It is not a rule book spirit. It's not something that we just learn and memorize and recite. It is a living, breathing, powerful manifestation of God, and He is an absolute miracle worker and healer. But we don't serve God because he moves babies back into the womb. We don't serve God because he can make cancerous tumors disappear. We don't serve God because he reverses blindness. And we've seen that. We don't serve God because he opens the ears of deaf children. We've seen that in our old building. We serve God because of who he is. And what he's going to do when all of our eyes are closed for the last time. You hear me? This is eternal. We have got to get back to the concepts of eternity. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. I'm, I'm nearly done. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Do I need the Holy Spirit if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Bible says that we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. All my life I've heard him preach the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. Not what it said. It said I'm going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. One one thousandth of a second. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. He said that this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. Let me tell you how this works. When Jesus left that grave, he left in a glorified body. A body that was as real as yours. People could see him and they could recognize him. He shared food with the disciples, but he was free from the limitations of the world. He literally walked through walls. He was absolutely God. He was absolutely transformed. He maintained his identity, but he was completely different. He was resurrected, and we serve the Lord not because he heals cancer, and he does. Not because he heals blindness, and he does. For something far more powerful than that, all of us, everybody in this room is a sinner. All of us have made our mistakes. All of us have dropped the ball. All of us have done it wrong. It's why we don't throw rocks at each other or turn a magnifying glass on one another's faults because all of us are fault filled. We're here today because we are sinners saved by grace and we celebrate the resurrection. We ought to do it every day, but we set a Sunday aside for a year because there's a reason for that. If that same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, then he shall also quicken your mortal body. You and I, if we die full of His Spirit, when the trumpet sounds, 
are coming back out of the grave. The Bible said to meet him in the air and that we'll be with him and we'll be like him. And that day is going to be as real as today. I think three different Easter's I, I, I talked about our first serious marital disagreement. We're not going to get into that today, but, but, but my, oh, my, my mother-in-law and my mom are here. We, we've got witnesses. Uh, uh, my wife's people are buried in, uh, uh, in this cemetery at the end of Lucas Drive on the banks of the Natchez River in Beaumont, Texas. And it's a beautiful, picturesque place. And she's got all sorts of uh, ancestors there and uh, uh, people that she knew and loved and several that I, uh, that I knew and loved now. And when we got married, she just assumed we were going to be buried there. And we were on our way to our, our first, uh, uh, funeral. I think one of your dad's 9,000 siblings maybe had passed away. And we're on our way uh, to the funeral and, and uh, she said, you know, we could be buried here. And I saw an opportunity to aggravate her. I said, oh, I don't want to be buried here. My family's buried in a redneck country cemetery in Hernando County, Mississippi. I didn't really care. That's where I want to be buried. We took the kids there a few years ago and took pictures. This one guy on his tombstone, his wife's name's this big, his name's this big. Don't say nothing about their kids. He's got a colored picture this big about his 1963 State Fair champion cow. And a full biography about the cow. That's how you know she died first. There's tombstones in there I don't think I can tell you about on the internet because it would cause controversy. It's a wild place. It's a, and I told her, how could you not want to be buried here? Longview's home now. She's picked out a cemetery. She tells me like every two months, it's north of town. You need to go there and buy plots before they run out. What are we going to do if they run out? So I'm just 45. I don't want to go pay for land and spend the next 40 years hoping to not go see it. We'll be dead. Let the kids cough up cash. We're paying for them now. Who cares what happens when we're dead? I'm just teasing it. But the truth is, it really doesn't matter if we're buried on the banks of the Natchez, if we're buried in the, in the middle of a country cemetery in northwest Mississippi, or if we're buried just a few miles from here, which is what's going to happen because she always wins. It's not my final resting place. It's temporary. Because if we believe the word of God just as surely as he came the first time, he's coming again. And the last time it ended with a resurrection. Honey, that's going to happen again. It may look like a, a, a cornfield when it's over. I don't have to be there forever. Bury me in what you want to. Pick out this casket you like. The day is coming and it's as real as this one that we are going to be with him and like him and if we believe that we should face life's challenges with an entirely different worldview. this isn't everything this isn't everything this isn't everything it's temporary let, 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 let's stand today I'm not one to quote Ricky Gervais very much but maybe we should get back to the basics of this I do agree with that. See, theology matters. Lord, help people that discount the book or, or, or try to equate traditions as equal to the book or avoid the scriptures that are inconvenient for their personal philosophy. But you hear me. We've got to be a theologically sound people. But Christianity did not begin with a theology. Or a doctrine. It started with a supernatural experience and revelation of the living Christ. And if you struggle with the book today, I'll tell you what will change your life. A real, living, supernatural experience with Jesus Christ. It's more than a belief system. He died and rose again to change you and to change me. I tiptoed down to an altar 
And my life changed when I repented of my sins. God, I know I've made a wreck. I'm young and it didn't take me long. You name it and I messed it up. And I want you to forgive me. And when I prayed that, He did. He forgave me and I felt forgiven. But oh, I felt forgiven and dirty. I've compared it before to working in the rain and the mud. Coming in and taking a warm shower and putting your wet, dirty clothes back on. That's how I felt. Like I'm clean, but there's just stuff. And I threw my heart into knowing him and loving him. I was a college freshman and devouring this book. And my life changed when I led the word remission. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. The removal. I said, I've got to do that. So I, man, I tore through the phone book. I've got to find somebody to baptize me in Jesus' name. Because that's what I want. And the next line, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It put me on a two-week Bible study. Didn't take me long to realize. I don't know what the Holy Ghost is, but I know I ain't got it. Because it ain't like that for me. Took me weeks to find people like you. All I knew about you was that you were strange and energetic compared to how I did, church. When I stumbled in... That very first time, I made my way down to the front. I just wanted to have a conversation. But that day in that service, something happened to me. For me, it started with the scripture. It was theology. But what happened to me that day, it was not theological. It was literal. And it was powerful. And God, in my life, changed when God filled me with His Spirit. It is the resurrection Spirit. All things are passed away and all things become new. He did that for me and I've never been the same. And you hear me in this house today. He died to do that for you. And He rose again to do that for you. This is not everything. Bear me where you want to. Dress me how you want to. There is coming an eternal day that will overshadow all of this. And the Bible said if we believe that, what sort of people ought we to be in all manner of conversations? Honey, this whole ball is going to melt with a fervent heat and we'll be with Him and like Him and your bills won't matter and your house won't matter and your health won't matter and your issues won't matter. It's everything. Let's ask Him to help us in this house together right now. Oh God, all over this building, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done. We ask right now, Lord, right now in this place, that you would help us individually and collectively just to take one more step toward you. Oh God, more than anything, that we can know and please you all the days of our life. God, we pray that you give us a heart meant for repentance. Lord, a spirit fit to respond to yours that we can leave here more like you than we are right now. In Jesus' name.